This is Macro Analytics, delivering frank conversations on global macroeconomics and market analysis outside the mainstream, featuring discussions and debates between Gordon T. Long, publisher and editor of GordonTLong.com and his guests. The content of this discussion is strictly the opinion of the participants. It is in no way a solicitation for business, nor is it to be considered investment advice of any sort. Always consult a registered investment advisor before making any investment decision. These discussions are extremely hard-hitting and terribly frank, and parental discretion is advised. Now, on to the show. I have Mebin Faber joining us this morning. Mevin is the uh, co-founder and the chief investment officer of Cambria Investment Management. He has authored a number of books, including Shareholder Yield, The Ivy Portfolio, and Global Value. He is a frequent speaker and writer on investment strategies. Welcome. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. We're here to talk about financial repression, but maybe we could just giving our listeners uh, an, an over, a quick overview of your background, what got you into the industry? Sure. Um, you know, like many, I didn't start out in the financial world. It's somewhat of a um, convoluted path. My background was engineering and biology. Uh, I started out actually as a biotech equity analyst, and then I uh, just kept gravitating more towards the quantitative side of the business, uh, mainly as I realized all the behavioral biases that, that I had. Um, wanted to make sure that I, I built a process for how to invest and thinking about the world. And so we started Cambria in 06, started managing money in 07, traditional hedge funds, separate accounts, and then really started launching ETFs uh, a couple years ago. We have five now um, and, and published a lot of research. So you can find research on my blog, Meb Faber, um, three books, getting ready to be the fourth out uh, Monday, March 2nd. So any of the listeners uh, want a free book, I'm happy to send you one. Just email me for, for taking the time to listen here. And then uh, a lot of white papers and research, too. So um, we, uh, we spend a lot of time thinking and, and writing about how, how we think about uh, the world and investing today. We're here, to, as I said, to talk financial repression. How would you define it in your words? What's it mean to you? What should our listeners be aware of? You know, the, the way that I've always thought about it is the technical sort of definition, which um, to me is more an environment where interest rates are lower than inflation. You know, so you have a sort of negative interest rate environment, which usually benefits someone and hurts someone else. And, and in my mind, the financial repression, which you have a uh, low real interest rates or even negative um, is an area that hurts savers. You know, it's good for borrowers. It's good for people that have a lot of debt because the inflation um, eats away at that debt. So someone like the U.S. government, you know, uh, but it's it's an environment that historically is very challenging for certain investments and it's good for others. Uh, but it but it varies, you know, the various times. But, but you, you see this a lot um, around the world right now with a, a really low interest rate environment. But not everywhere. There's some countries that have really high real interest rates that are probably great places to invest. But then they may have currency issues. Mm -hmm. That's just the, the tip of the iceberg. But yes, there's, uh, there's, there's always usually the places you want to invest around the world. It's usually the hardest and, and they look often look the worst currently. So it's, uh, there's, there's usually warts on almost any investment. One of the cornerstones of, uh, of financial repression of the four is uh, is negative rates, negative interest rates, uh, negative nominal rates uh, have now appeared on the scene. So especially throughout Europe. So just in the short time that we've been doing this, we've watched these interest rates get even more challenging for many of the industries. What part of your strategy globally is it impacting you? How are you seeing it front and center? Um, historically, if you look at the different market regimes, stocks and bonds love high real interest rates. Um, that environment is very positive for stocks and bonds. Um, they typically don't love negative real rates or low real rates, and, and um, there's other asset classes that do. So gold, for example, one of the reasons gold did so well over the, the, this past decade, not so much the last year or two, is because real rates were negative. But if you look around the world, so the way we think about investing, there's two main camps that, that we like and we think about. And the funny thing is, is they're somewhat opposed to each other. And many people like politics or religion, you know, fall on one side or the other. But those two camps are value and momentum. And a lot of people say, look, I'm a value guy. 
I'm a Warren Buffett style investor. Then there's other people say, no, no, I invest with the trend. It makes a lot more sense to be a momentum trend guy. And we think both can work. And they both can work within asset classes um, and and across them. But the way you see the world, the way the world is right now, a lot of the cheap stuff. My favorite's when value and momentum intersect, and a lot of the cheap stuff right now is not what's going up. You may that may have changed in the last month or so, but if we look at say equities, for example, around the world, um, we use Schiller's ten-year PE ratio as a good benchmark to to look at equities, and historically it's around seventeen. Um, it can be a little higher when interest rates are tame or inflation is tame, but right now in the U.S. it's at 27. And that's not a horrific number. We don't think it's a bubble. It's been as high as 45 and it's been as low as 5. But in general, that's going to be a headwind for future returns. But the good news is most of the rest of the world is pretty cheap, um, including a lot of the world is really cheap, um, particularly Europe, a lot of countries that no one wants to invest in like Russia or Greece or Brazil. Um, so you see a lot of great valuations. However, most of the momentum has been in U.S. stocks and bonds. You know, that's been in, in real estate. Uh, that's been the positive trends. Again, that may have been changing in the last month. You're seeing, you know, for example, Russia is probably the top performing stock market in the world this year. It was one of the worst last year, if not the worst. But um, the favorites when they intersect. So that's kind of the, the really long-winded answer to your simple question. But the way we see the world right now is, um, a lot of opportunity, uh, particularly abroad. You've got some thought on portfolios on a global basis, using GDP as a balancing mechanism or market cap. Could you elaborate on that for our listeners? Right. You know, the, the, the very basic John Bogle S indexing, the way the world market cap portfolio is just based on size, right? So if, if you think about in the U.S., it's the same thing with the S&P 500. The only weighting mechanism is size. And Really, that has a lot more to do with simply price. And so Apple is obviously the largest company in the U.S., um, and the U.S. is the largest in the, in the global portfolio. And one of the exercises we usually do when giving talks is we ask people to say, all right, write down or think about of your stock portfolio, if you're an American, what percentage do you have in the U.S.? And almost universally, I've done this about 30 times, it's around 70%. Some may have it as low as 65 and some as high as 85. But on average, that's what the audience average is. But the U.S. is a percentage of world market cap is only half. So even if you're a diehard John Bogle indexer um, and you want to replicate the world, the U.S. is only half. And then if you go a step further and say, all right, well, what percent is the U.S. is of GDP? And it's only about, I think, a, a, a fifth maybe a quarter, but it's somewhere around there, 20, 25%. Um, and then a step further, if you say, all right, well, let's wait on valuations. Well, out of the 45-odd countries we track, the U.S., I think, is the third most expensive. Now, again, it's not – we don't think it's a bubble. We don't think it's horrific, but it's a headwind. So there's a lot of reasons, and particularly now, after this six-year run going into year seven bull market, um, we think it makes a lot of sense to have foreign exposure – my recommendation is at least half abroad. That's very uncomfortable. It's called home country bias, but it happens everywhere. And so not just Americans, but Italians and, and Brits and Aussies and everyone else allocates what their own market is. Um, but our recommendation is is a minimum of half in, in foreign equities and, and preferably more. We start with the investable universe of what we call the developed and emerging countries. That's, um, you know, we use, there's various other index providers, but it's about 45 countries. And that represents the vast majority of, of world equity assets. You could go into the frontier, but, you know, you're starting to get um, into the really, really illiquid small stuff. And there's some countries, of course, that move in and out. Greece used to be developed. Now in some indexes, it's emerging. And <laughs> who knows what path they continue on. They may eventually be frontier. But we start with that universe, and you know, one of our ETFs, one of our funds, goes out and buys the 11 cheapest countries in the world. And it's a hard thing to do. Usually, um, the cheapest countries are the ones that have already declined the most. They have the worst GDP, the worst currency returns, uh, terrible geopolitical headlines. I mean, basket that we own right now. I mean, who's in the headlines every day? It's Greece. It's Russia. But historically. A value strategy can often take years for these strategies. Avoiding those markets that, that have these massive bubbles 
um, is just as important as investing in the in the cheapest uh, countries and companies. The emotional challenge and one of the reasons using value works is that it's hard to do. You know, I don't think any of your listeners that watch this video or listen to this in their car run home to their wife or to their um, clients and say, you know what, I heard this great interview. Let's go buy Greece and Russia, right? You know, that it's it's a career risk. Um, they may get fired. It's painful. You know, the, the, the countries are doing inflammatory things politically. I mean, look at Putin every day. I mean, he's invading countries, shooting down planes. You know, the, the governments usually um, are, are a total mess. Greece is in the headlines every single day. But that is where the opportunity is created, right? At some point, the, the price moves too far uh, away from, from what the valuation probably should be. Um, and, uh, you know, who knows? Will, will this be a year that the foreign starts? Foreign outperforms the U.S. It's, it's, it's a coin flip, right? Whether the U.S. or foreign does better in any given year. Um, but the U.S. has had an incredible run since, oh, the bottom in 09, and foreign hasn't kept up. So we think it's a, it's a really good time uh, to be allocating to foreign uh, right now. The nice thing about a lot of the cheap countries we have right now is they're fun places to visit. Uh, the, the good thing about being a quant is a lot of that, um, it's, it's fun to talk about and it's interesting, but it really doesn't make its way into the portfolio. Um, and going back to the behavioral biases I talked about earlier, you know, I realized that the best way I can create the research and manage portfolios is to quantify it. Um, and so it, it's interesting and it's fun. And there's no one that loves the old Jim Rogers style books more than I do, you know, about traveling the world and boots on the ground and, and um, you know, Vietnam or Argentina or all these places. And I think there can be value add from that. But uh, the, at least our approach has always been much more comfortable quantifying it and getting out of my own way because I, I would probably just muck it up and make it make it worse. What are the biggest mistakes you see investors are making right now besides not being a foreign diversified portfolio? It's, it's the classic mistakes, and, and there's a couple of them. The first is not getting out of their own way. And this, this isn't just individuals. This is institutions. This is professionals. It's getting caught up in performance, right? So it's the classic chasing performance of what's working well, getting out of what's working poorly, and not really having a plan. You know, so most investors that react emotionally, there's a ton of research that shows just how bad investors are at timing their investments, right? So um, there's AAI tracks sentiment. And if you look at the, the most bullish investors ever were on stocks, it was in December 1999, right? The absolute worst time to be bullish. And when were they most bearish? Of course, it was March 2009. So understanding your own, have, having real estate expectations and getting out of your own way, that's number one. Number two, I think the biggest problem is investors often are not, um, they don't pay enough attention to fees in their various investments and they can add up pretty quickly. You know, the, we think the glo uh, we think the U.S., uh, uh, traditional 60-40 portfolio is only going to return low single digits right now and if you're paying a lot in fees, uh, that really chips away at, at much of the return. So that's the big number two. So it's n not having a plan and, and not and getting in your own way. Paying too much is is a big number two. And and going along with it, and I mentioned it briefly. Number one was is just not having realistic expectations. You know, a lot of people expect stocks, mm -hmm. especially after a seven year run. You look at all the private investing that's going on right now. You're looking at. Um, you're starting to see some silly stuff in uh, venture capital, in buybacks. Typically, you know, the buybacks and M and A track the the stock market, and so you're starting to see a lot of that right now. But uh, it's not the biggest thing is is not having a plan. That's a problem. That's a problem. It's in a, anything. <laughs> it's, it's a problem. And, and to continue on that is that a lot of investors become too wedded to their style. You know, there's people out there say, look, I'm a gold bug or, you know, I'm a stock guy, but every asset class has its moment in the sun and times when it does horribly, you know, us stocks have declined, um, 80 over 80% before, you know, and, and in bonds in real terms have been declined by half. So th th there's a lot of these investments that people come wedded to. It's hard to become asset class agnostic. 
but uh, but it's important. We have a lot of our listeners are into precious metals, whether it's gold, silver, platinum, some mix. What's your views on the precious metals? You know, the largest hedge fund in the world, Bridgewater, Ray Dalio, who runs it, just came out in a, in a recent book and mentioned that, you know, for retail and, or individual investors, uh, I think it was 15% maybe in, in precious metals, which, which is one of the larger allocations. I know Mark Faber, no relation to me, I'm sure we share some bloodlines somewhere, but came on, um, and he often recommends a quarter in precious metals. And one of the interesting things we did in our book... Sorry to interrupt, but I had him on last yeah. week, and he was quite emphatic, and he says, right now it's irresponsible not to have some precious metals right. in and your so, portfolio. He wasn't saying north. Of, he wasn't saying a percentage, yeah. but just well, he, he's 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 mentioned a lot before that he he puts a quarter in in a, 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 a four buckets. I think it's precious metals, stocks, bonds, and maybe real estate, something like that. But but this book that we just published, we looked at fifteen of the most famous asset allocation strategies, and Marx was one of them. But also the Ray Dalio one we just mentioned, sixty forty permanent portfolio, risk parity, endowment style, everything. Larry Swedro. Um, 712, all these portfolios, right? And a really surprising takeaway is that most of them had some of the three main ingredients, which are stocks, bonds, and real assets. So real assets, I include commodities like precious metals, but also real estate and and maybe tips, treasury, and inflation-protected securities. And as long as you have a little bit of each of those, the portfolios tend to all do well. You know, the big difference, of course, was the 70s. What did well in the 70s then flipped and didn't do as well in the 80s and 90s because it's different market environment. But the shocking takeaway from, from this book is that if you go back to 1972 through 2013, I think, the spread between the best performing and worst performing portfolio was under two percentage points per year. And if you exclude permanent portfolio, which is a lower volatility, so it, I say it doesn't really count, but because it's a consistent portfolio but low volatility, those 15 strategies, the spread was one percentage points a year. So if you think about that and you think about how much time you know we all spend as professionals working on asset allocation and thinking about it, you know the, the bigger takeaway is, one, to not pay a lot of fees. That's for buy and hold, by the way. Not to pay a lot in fees, but make sure you have a little bit of each of those. In any of the portfolios that didn't have one of those kind of stools, you know, legs for the stool, stocks, bonds, or, or real assets, usually was sub really suboptimal, especially in one period. And that's the challenge with the buy and hold. You want to build a portfolio that will do well in any market environment, whether it's um, low interest rates, high interest rates, declining inflation, deflation, what, growth, um, whatever it may be. And you need you need – a portion of in each of those sort of areas to really have the portfolio be robust. In the portfolio or in the balance, it can't all necessarily or shouldn't necessarily all be security, stocks, bonds, ETFs, et cetera, because there's other areas like collectibles, physical, real estate itself, sure. antique items, hard assets. How does an investor start to weigh that in? You know, it, it's, it becomes a very holistic, you know, view, right? And it's, there's even other, steps you can go into like um, accounting for uh, pension plans, right? Or accounting if you're for a young, if you're a younger investor, accounting for your human capital, meaning if you have a salary and or a steady job that, that is unlikely to get disrupted. If you're a doctor, say, you know, that's a steady income stream that's almost bond like, you know, how do you account for that? How do you account for um, like you mentioned collectibles? And so it's it's taking the ten thousand foot view. You know, when when I value a lot of my investments that are illiquid, and looking at worst case scenarios, whether it's housing, whether it's uh, like you mentioned, a lot of these um, collectible types, it's saying, look, the worst case is these can decline by half or more in some cases. Some you can write them off as a total wash. You know, but but any asset can decline, you know, X percentage. But it's taking that ten thousand foot view. Um, and having a holistic view of of what your entire world portfolio looks like. Um, But it's interesting on the collectible side and interesting on a lot of the hard assets because it's a little more esoteric, right? It's it's a lot of the value of gold or a painting or a lot of things you think about is, and stocks too, it's, as Kurt Vonnegut, you know, once said, it's just like, it's what people are willing to pay. You know, it's, it's what... 
what people made their mind up it's worth and and that's the that's the fun of our business of course and it changes very quickly and don't confuse that with being liquid and being able to uh, to to uh, get in and out of the a lot of the moves today the big moves are happening in the currency markets especially with what i will term currency wars that are going on but minimally the debase outright debasement of currencies to gain competitive advantage and without necessarily getting at that as a strategy is diversification the way to protect yourself from that the, the short answer to that question is yes the longer answer um, is is more nuanced and interesting I think currencies are an area where I think particularly Americans it's it's challenging you know you, you travel the world and currencies are very forefront but being the reserve currency affords a little luxury um, for for Americans where they don't typically we don't think about it as much and the best description I've heard of currencies was an author that said currencies aren't difficult they're just confusing and if you think most people think about currencies in the sense that hey I'm going to Argentina stakes are gonna be cheap or, or Europe you know it's gonna be cheaper to go skiing there this year because the euro is going down or it's more expensive to travel to, to wherever um, but when you think about it from the investing standpoint Real currency returns for the major currencies, so net of inflation, are fairly stable over time. And the key phrase being over time, measured by years and decades. Any given year, like we've seen with the yen, the euro, the Swiss franc, they can go up and down 10, 20, 30, 40%, right? But over time, they tend to be fairly stable. Um, and so when you go back and say, all right, well, the implementation, should I, for example, hedge my, my currency exposure to foreign stocks. We're actually agnostic on that topic, but we think that you either do or you don't. You pick one and stick with it. The challenge is that you don't want to mess around with it You know, once, once you've decided that option. We think hedging currencies with foreign bonds actually makes a lot more sense because typically government bonds, government bonds are much lower volatility, and so you're adding more volatility to an asset class that historically doesn't have much volatility. Uh, so hedging foreign government bonds we think makes a lot of sense. Um, but then you also can view currencies as an asset class in and of itself. And there's not a lot of strategies out there designed for the investor in public vehicles. But you can apply very simple strategies such as um, the most famous is carry, you know, investing in the highest yielding currencies, borrowing in the lower yielding. And historically that works. That's the worst of the currency strategies in my mind because it doesn't diversify a traditional portfolio because it usually gets hammered when everything else is getting hammered. But you can also apply momentum or value. You know, you think about the old Big Mac index, right, where currency is cheapest. And a lot of these strategies work. Um, it, it's just challenging because there's not, it's not easy to trade. And as, as an individual, you know, you got to use futures or there's not a whole lot of currency funds out there um, in the U.S. that we think attack the problem correctly. Uh, but so that was the long-winded answer to the original part, which was just, yes, diversification helps. Up against our hard line, any key messages for our listeners you'd like to leave with them besides diversification? Yeah, you know, diversification, I think, is, is certainly the free lunch. You know, if, if you've been following my reading and writing for a long time, you know, I'm very much a tactical and trend follower by, by nature. I think it's a philosophical choice for people. I, I, I hate watching investments decline um, and, and not doing anything, right? So the potential, so oil is a great example, the potential of something that could go down, you know, to a, to a value that where you lose 20, 40, 60, 80% um, is, is very difficult for my psyche. So, um, but so the advice to investors is come up with an investing plan that fits your own personality. Um, Study enough history to know what the worst case scenarios are for that plan. Uh, so, so I have realistic expectations, and then to stick with it. You know, not not to mess around and, and start to do crazy things with the portfolio when your emotions are tempting you to. And then after that, just go go enjoy life and don't spend as much time on on worrying about investing. How could uh, our listeners, viewers, learn more about your writings, the work that you're doing, um, and your books? Sure. Uh, we got four books on March 2nd on Amazon, two of which will be free that week. So depending on when you listen to this, you can go download 
two free books and get the third for three bucks. Or if you email me, I'll send you a free copy. Uh, I got a website. My blog is mebfaber.com. There's over 1,500 articles on there. So uh, plenty of writing. We have a number of white papers. And then my company's uh, money management website is cambriafunds.com. We have five ETFs out with more to come. And, uh, yeah, shoot me an email. I'm more than, uh, more than happy to send you a free book for listening in. That's a great uh, opportunity for everybody to you know, get a couple free books. And, again, that is starting which week? The free book and um, well, I'll send you one any, any listener. But the the two free books on Amazon starts the week of March second for five days. So okay. download way. I expect a book report if you read it. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. We'll catch. Anyway, thank you for your time, and we got we got to pick this conversation up later in the year. So, thanks for having me. Talk to you again. Bye. This has been Gordon T. Long, editor and publisher of GordonTLong.com. New recordings are posted regularly and can be found at gordontlong.com. New show notifications are available through RSS feed, iTunes, and other social networking venues at gordontlong.com.